So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with our introductions. I know Tamara is going to be joining us a little bit later. She had a family emergency, and so she's going to pop on a little bit later. Um, but welcome, everybody, to our panel discussion following the screening of the incredible documentary, They Ain't Ready For Me. If we haven't met, although I think most of you I've met, uh, my name is Marcy Stagner, and I'm the program director of cultural arts, adult services, and special events at the Memphis Jewish Community Center. Tonight, I am thrilled to welcome Brad Rothschild, Brad Rothschild, who directed the film, They Ain't Ready For Me, along with many other films that I would love to hear more about, along with Tom Shadiak, filmmaker of films like Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, Bruce Almighty, Patch Adams, Liar Liar, many, many more. And Tom is also the founder of Memphis Rocks and One Family Memphis, which is a nonprofit that brings rehabilitation, healing, and a renewed sense of hope to challenged communities by providing a climbing facility and programs to foster relationships across cultural, racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Joining us a little bit later, of course, is Tamar Manasa, who starred in the film or who the documentary was about. And not only is Tamar the subject of the film, They Ain't Ready For Me, that we all loved, um, that we're going to get into, but she also founded the organization MASK, of course, that's also featured in the film that stands for Mothers or Men Against Senseless Killing. And, um, you know, after I first watched this film when my committee and I, we were, you know, trying to decide what the lineup was going to look like for this year. And we knew we were going to show this film. I immediately thought of the connection between what Tamar does with Mask and what Tom is doing in Memphis with Memphis Rocks. And um, we're going to talk about the connections there. But first, I'm going to start with Brad. Um, can you... Can you talk about how you connected with Tamar and discovered her work and what inspired you to make this film? Sure. So it was October, 2016. And- There's Tamar. There's Tamar. It was October, 2016. And I was reading uh, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, the JTA puts out a daily email blast with different articles. Uh, there's Tamar. Hi Tamar. And and there is an article titled Black Rabbinical Student Leads Army of Moms Against Gun Violence in Chicago. And I thought, oh, that, this looks like an interesting uh, story. What, you know, what's going on? And at the, the top of the piece, there's a picture of this striking woman named Tamar Manasseh. And I go on to read about the unbelievable work that she's doing on the south side of Chicago uh, to prevent gun violence and the organization Mask, Mothers and Men Against Senseless Killing that she created. And I, the more I'm reading this, the more interesting it's becoming to me. And, and then I get hit with uh, the hook, which is Tamar says that it is her Judaism that makes her an activist. And I thought, I really, really want to talk to this woman. I really want to get to hear her story. And I pretty much knew immediately I wanted to make a film about her. So I reached out to her on social media and through her organization's website. And she didn't immediately get back to me. So I kept trying and, and you know, I, I sent her an email. And I introduced myself as a documentary filmmaker from New York City. And I said, I really would like to talk to you about exploring the possibility of making a documentary film. And when she finally wrote back, she wrote, I think my life is about as interesting as watching the paint dry. So thank you for your interest, but I'm going to pass. And I wrote back to her and I said, with all due respect, I disagree. And I would hope that you would reconsider. So that kind of started this off again, on again correspondence that we had, mostly me reaching out to her and her not getting back to me, but I, I still was undeterred. And um, we had a couple of phone conversations and each one of them sort of blew me further away. And I was like, she's unbelievable. And finally, one day I get this direct message from her on Facebook and she says, I'm in Staten Island. I can meet you now if you want to meet. So for everybody in Memphis out there, I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Uh, Staten Island, which is technically part of New York City, is nowhere near where I live. Uh, but I, I wrote her back immediately. I said, give me two hours and I'll be there. And I dropped what I was doing and I raced out to Staten Island 
and I met her and we sat for a couple of hours. And at the end of the conversation, she kind of shrugged her shoulders and she said, you know, I guess if you want to make this film, we can do it this coming summer when we get back out on the block. And that was it. That was, uh, that's the origin story of the film. Thank you so much, Brad. And Tamar, I don't know how long we have you for, so I'm going to try, I'm going to come to you next, if that's all right. Um, you don't have me for long. So. <laughs> okay, so real quick, I know Tamar, you've got a lot going on right now. Thank you so much for popping in. Tamar's had a, a family emergency come up, and so we're just, we're grateful that you were able to join us, even for a little bit. Um, so thank you. Tamar, can you tell us, first, tell us about MASK, how you came to create this organization, um, kind of where you see it moving forward, and 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 what inspired you to start doing what you're doing? Because you didn't, where you are now and where you started are in two different places, right? It's just across the street. It's, it's on one side of the street versus the other side of the street. And um, I basically started MASK because I didn't want my kids to die. And I did it to protect my kids, to save my kids' lives. I mean, I had son I have a daughter and when I started it they were both you know becoming older teenagers and they didn't need me to drive them everywhere anymore I didn't necessarily know all of their friends and the thing is with violence and I mean not just in the city but anywhere you go it doesn't matter as a parent how you raise your kids you don't know how their friends are being raised you don't know who the friends of their friends are so it's not it's not like your kid might do something that might get them shot or make decisions, bad decisions and put them in places that they shouldn't be when they shouldn't be there. Sometimes they're with friends. They're with friends who are with other friends. And those people are targeted. And if they are targeted, then your kids are targeted. And so the thing for me was I wanted to understand what was causing the violence. What was at the root of it? Because I had to stop it before it was one of my kids. And the only way I could stop it is if I understood it. But I couldn't understand it sitting behind a desk. I couldn't understand it sitting in my living room or I couldn't do that. I, I couldn't do that. I had to actually be out there in it. I had to be immersed in it to understand it. And so um, that was what, seven years ago. And like I've been hard at work every day since because it's not just a job to me. This is how I keep my kids alive. But it's almost like I feel like um. God put me here to do this work and it's very hard work and it's not a lot of people that want to do this and it's scary sometimes and it's risky sometimes and it's all of these things and but I know that I can do it just because I'm black and I'm a Jew and I know that I can do these things and I feel like if I don't do them then I'm not holding up my end of the work and that's when I lose a kid so people say sometimes like oh well you know you need to go on vacation or take a break or you know you're going to get burnt out this is going to happen that's going to happen this is not work for me this is a way of life uh, my life is completely committed to saving the lives of of young people to ending gun violence so if gun violence happens every single day then we have to fight it every single day so that's what mask is that's what i do and i understand that gun violence is not just one thing it's made up of all of these other issues and so if you start talking about education and you start looking at food insecurity and you start looking at unemployment and education and you start addressing all these issues that exist within just those categories, then you don't necessarily have as much gun violence as you had before. You don't have as much violence, period, as you had before. So that's really like what we do at Mass and what you guys saw in the movie is exactly um, Memphis is so near and dear to my heart. I was just in Memphis this morning, <laughs> but Memphis is so near and dear to my heart that Memphis is basically, there's a street corner and Memphis is going to look exactly like the corner that you saw on the block later on this summer. They're going to build a school. They're going to do a lot of the same things because they want solutions in their community too. They don't want to lose their kids either. So they want to do, if it worked in Chicago, it could definitely work in North Memphis. So they are really committed to doing all of the things that they've seen us do in Chicago and they're inspired by it. And I'm inspired by all of the work they're doing. So just over Thanksgiving, we not only passed out Thanksgiving dinner boxes to residents in Memphis, we also took it all the way down to Mississippi, to the Delta. So I'm, I'm really impressed by how hardworking the people are there and how motivated they are to make a real change in their community. 
And anytime you meet a group like that who want to do the work, then I'm more than happy to work with them. Thank you so much, Tamar. And speaking of um, work that's being done in Memphis, and I see we have a comment in the chat about we need to bring masks to Memphis. I want to turn the conversation to Tom for a second, because like I said, Tom, of course, um, is the director of all these films that we know very well. And he's also the founder of Memphis Rocks and One Family Memphis, whose mission is uh, not so different than the mission of Mask. And so, Tom, can you talk a little bit about what brought you to Memphis, why Memphis Rocks, and and what it's what the organization is doing to help uplift communities, not in North Memphis, but in South Memphis. Yo, first of all, Tamar, I, I really want to say how inspiring you are. And I, I feel like I know your soul. And it's souls like you that are so lit up with a divine flame uh, that really light, you know, people that you may never meet. And so you have an energy that is moving. And, and, and I can feel it across the screen and, and across this, this geographic divide. Brad, thank you for capturing her story. Uh, every movie I've ever made has been about some kind of character who meets a crisis with, with a soul force and a power. And we have a living, breathing, authentic uh, a story in front of us. So, um, you know, Tamar, your story and my story are very similar. You came at it as a parent. I came to Memphis to teach for one semester because I have some family roots here and I fell in love with these kids and they became my family. Now they're not my biological kids, but I feel like they're my younger brothers and sisters and, and my children uh, that have been elected again through that divine connection. And I saw them, uh, you know, being the victims of violence. I lost, a, 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 my students lost a dear friend at Lemoyne Owen College, a historical black college. Mm -hmm. And it was very preventable. And it's, it, 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 uh, I had to become educated as to why this is happening. I, you know, uh, you know, I'm from the fix it, you know, generate, we got to fix it. We got to fix it. And that's not what yeah. you do. You, what we do is what you do, which is you get in relationship. It yeah. all comes from relationship. So we are in relationship with a beautiful community that was one of the most violent neighborhoods in America, sadly, because it's just underserved. There are no jobs. There's a history of oppression. We've never met that history, taking accountability and responsibility. And so we're here to be in relationship and bring resources to those lives. And it's mine's like yours. It's a love story. And uh, I feel like it's God appointed because, you know, I feel like when you have that connection with the universal spirit that put us all here, that you can't help but serve your brother and sister. That's that's you. You know, that's another divine reflection mm -hmm. of you. And so that what you do for those in need, you 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 do for all. So again, I just want to thank you for what you're doing. We've been able to do some similar things, serve like 100 to 200 lunches a day free during the pandemic. We charge, you know, we we turn no one away from an inability to pay. I had resources, you know, because of my movie career. I, I, I brought them to the community. So we were able to build something, mm -hmm. whereas I think you did it in a more powerful way, which is you just brought presence and love. I brought resources, which not necessarily, you know, it's a form of energy, but you got to bring the love with those resources. Mm -hmm. And it also built something big that we didn't have the community fully support yet. They thought, who is this crazy person? Why is he doing this crazy thing? And, you know, by showing up every day, they, they've come, we've come to trust each other and love each other but I really love how you do it and how you did it. I think every great thing starts with an act of love, as simple an act as that and, and powerful. And I'm, I'm really, you know, really inspired by you. And uh, I can't wait to tell my kids about you in this movie. You know, that's so true. Everything has to be done out of love. If it's not done out of love, it, it'll never work. It won't succeed. So that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Amen. And if anybody watching has not been to Memphis Rocks, um, let me know if you would like a tour and I'm happy to set that up and go with you and show you around. It's a really, really incredible facility doing really incredible work from free meals to job training to filmmaking to manufacturing cutting boards and, and like other merchandise that goes back into the community and nobody's turned away for their inability to pay. And there's a, a gym and like, it's really incredible. So if you've never been, um, get in touch with me and I'll go down there with you and, and give you the good tour. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to, I want to kind of switch to some harder, to some, some, some maybe more uncomfortable questions because something that I've noticed in these conversations that we have, um, 
with somebody who is uh, black and Jewish. Why do we feel the need to expect people who are black and Jewish to explain how or why that is when we don't expect somebody like me who's white and Jewish to explain why I'm white and Jewish or why I'm a woman or why I'm, you know, anything. But oftentimes we, we, we see somebody or we meet somebody or we are with a speaker or something who's black and Jewish and we feel the need to ask them why or how. Do you have any um I, I don't know. I think that's a problem that should be discussed in most synagogues on Shabbat morning. It's not my problem. I'm not the one that feels like I have to explain. It's the person who's asking, how can I be black and Jewish? That probably needs to do some soul searching because black Christians never say, hey, how am I black and Christian? And white Christians never say, how are you white? How are you black and a Christian? They never do that. So I think the Jewish community, the non-white Jewish community, needs to do some soul searching of their own and really understand why is it such an anomaly? Why is someone who's black and Jewish just weird, but it's okay for somebody to be black and Muslim and black and Christian, but not black and Jewish. The problem isn't with me. And and it's not on me to explain anything. I have too much going on to explain to somebody basic, basic, just human decency. I'm black. I can be whatever I want to be. And it shouldn't be the one thing that I shouldn't ever want to be or I shouldn't be as Jewish. What does that say about Judaism? What does that say about the people who are practitioners of Judaism and why black people can't be Jews? It's almost like, how did you manage to get in? That's not a good look. And it's not like it it, it, it reflects poorly on me. So I really hope that that is a conversation that is happening in synagogues all over this country. And that's what I'm hoping for, because that's where it needs to start. I can't tell people, I can't tell them, hey, this is why you shouldn't mind me being a Jew. I don't care, actually. I don't care enough to explain it to you. If you still feel like me being a Jew is somehow threatening to you being a Jew, hey, that's not my problem. That's nothing I can fix. So I'm so I just, glad that you're... I don't even try. Yeah. I'm so glad that you um, answered the question the way that you did, because... It is 100% up to um, the white Jews like me to talk with each other about why we wonder these things or why we think these things or why the question's even coming up because it's not up to you um, or to other black Jews to explain it to us, right? That's on us. And so I'm so glad that you framed it that way. That's a really important conversation. I'm glad that we're talking about it. And we need to talk about it more. And we need to not rely on whether it's a Black Jewish person to explain why that is to us, or whether it's um, something that we don't understand about maybe like racism in general, like that it's it's definitely not up to the Black community to explain that to the white community. It's our responsibility to learn ourselves. I tell this story all the time. Um, about when Dr. King marched through Marquette Park in Chicago and um, he was uh, hit in the head with a brick. And he said, oh, this racism in Chicago was worse than anywhere he had ever been. It was, it was more heated and it was terrible. And that neighborhood was just, it just so happened to be um, the home to the American Nazi Party, which was right around the corner from a synagogue that Dr. King was using as a safe house. But the next day, after Dr. King was hit in the head with the brick, he went to church and, and he delivered a sermon about it. And because he was a minister, because he was still a Christian, the guy who hit him in the head, the white guy who hit him in the head, he went to church the next day, too, because he, too, was a Christian. He didn't say, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore because this black guy is a Christian now. Dr. King didn't say, hey, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore because this guy hit me in the head and he was, he's a Christian. No. Somehow, with all of the hatred that was there, there was still enough room in Christianity for those two people. Why can't Judaism understand? Why can't Judaism get that? Why can't Jews get that? Why is that easy enough for those people? But it's so much, so, so much more difficult for us to grasp that. And I don't have an answer, and it's work that we need to do. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to do. That is the work. That's the work. Um. So, Tom, what can you say about how, how rocks helps to curb the violence in Memphis, in South Memphis? You mentioned that, of course, you know, Memphis Rocks is in one of the most 
um, violent zip codes in the in the country. What is how does Memphis Rocks contribute to curbing that? Well, again, it starts with relationship. It starts with loving people and providing, uh, as Tamar is providing, a place for people to go. You know, there are not many options in our neighborhood. Uh, I think the same as in, in your neighborhood in Chicago. Uh, you know, an option that historically has been provided is to go into a certain lifestyle that will provide some resources that might not be legal. And that involves drugs and crimes, et cetera. And that leads to violence and jail. And if you provide another option and you show the kids you're trustworthy and you're going to show up, they'll show up. I mean, at first they didn't believe we were going to be there. So they started to steal from us and they started to steal from us, not because they're bad kids, but because they thought, oh, they call us turkey people. We're going to come deliver a turkey. Then we're going to be gone. We're never going to come back. We come at Thanksgiving and then we leave. So they don't they don't trust us. But when they realize they could trust us, they stopped stealing from us. They realized it was their facility. And, and, and we start to get into a relationship and then the violence starts to diminish because those kids are not now in violent situations. And then they bring their friends who are on the periphery of violence into the gym and it's a concentric circle that runs out. So, um, you know, I, I just want to comment. It's, it's hard to comment after a deep subject like, you know, why, you know, certain, you know, prejudices exist regarding, you know, ethnocentric, religious, you know, representation. But we got the same problem in Catholicism. By the way, Tamar, you already are a rabbi. I mean, uh, you know, I don't know what it technically means to be a rabbi. Uh, I, I was raised in the Catholic Christian faith, but I always remember Jesus was a Jew. He wasn't a Christian. <laughs> Jesus was a Jew. So, mm -hmm. you know, I meet him at as an original place. Um, but we have the same problem in, in, in our church where we have suppressed the light of female leadership. And that has to yeah. stop. You know, they, they yeah. didn't. That, the film is very powerful. It doesn't even take a vote on this woman who is obviously as strong a rabbi as anybody in the faith because her actions are, are, are speaking volumes. Her actions are scriptural. They're another Torah that's alive today. And 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 she is not even allowed to get a vote. And so, you know, it's what James Baldwin said. James Baldwin said, um, you know, the N-word. You know, he said, the N-word is, is, it's not, I've never been the N-word, he said, right? I've always been a man, right? You had to, and he's speaking to the white community, you had to invent the N-word. So the N-word's in you. So you got to figure out why it is that you invented the N-word. What is it about you that you couldn't face, that you had to project that problem outside of yourself? So this problem is in all of us the fear of the light of women, the fear of that compassionate soul that can lead us to a place that is less competitive, that is more cooperative, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it's something that we, we're all, we all have to struggle with. And, and I want to take my share of responsibility. That was great. I really have to meet you next time I come to Memphis. It was my fault. I heard you were here and I had a medical issue myself that I had to go. Uh, yeah, and, and then... Yeah, it just, I'm sorry. But like here, like in, in Memphis, like in Chicago, when the movie wrapped, we built a school on that corner. What we did was we took, um, we took, because what we don't get funding. We don't get any state or federal. We don't get any government funding at all. All of our donations are like high. It's like $18, $36. And it's just a lot of people donate to us. So that's where we get it from. We get a lot of little donations, not really any major foundation. But what we did was we identified like were the most likely to kill and be killed and we sent them to trade school and we gave them a stipend to go to trade school. Mm -hmm. So now you can go to school and you don't have to worry about how you're going to eat or bus fare or gas money or any of that. All you have to do is go to school. So um, when they were done, actually Jermaine is one of the young people that went. You met him in the movie. And um, it was there were so many kids who wanted to go. Everybody couldn't be accommodated by the school that they wanted to go to. So we decided to build a trade school on the corner. So all of those young kids who never got to go to high school because they shut all the public high schools down in our neighborhood, all of those kids, um, kids who dropped out with GEDs and life skills and, and, and job training and stuff like that, we were we built a school to do all of that, and we actually built it out of shipping containers, retrofitted mm -hmm. as classrooms, and we put it on the corner. 
And the, the only reason we didn't end up turning it into a trade school was because COVID hit. And now every day we have nearly, I mean, we have to do seven kids max per container. But if we rotate them in and out, we can have 40 kids there every day. And these kids are doing e-learning and they're getting hot meals. They're getting all of this really, um, this really specialized care and all of this attention that they didn't get in public school because how much attention can, can a teacher give one kid when she has 35 students? So we have maybe three teachers to 10 kids. So they get the education is a lot different that they receive there. There's a lot more contact. There's a lot more consideration. So we do that every day. And we don't we don't have like I didn't come with the resources. I wish I did, but I didn't. So it's kind of like we have to fundraise. We have to do these things, but they're important. Because they give kids access to education um, that they might not otherwise get. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, if you're in high school, you're not going to travel. Um, if you go two miles in either way, you're crossing through three or four different gang territories. And you can get killed in any of those places. And when you get there, what is the what level of education are you getting? So if you're going somewhere and they're not really teaching you anything and you're still risking your life to go, chances are you're not going to go. So what we're trying to do is make education more accessible. It's not learning that kids don't like. It's school that they don't like. It's actually the school itself, the building itself. It's the placement of the building itself. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like if we learn to look at school in a different way, we look at that school, education in a different way. You change how they learn and what they learn. The world changes. So. Um, we opened our doors March 17th of last year when the whole world went into hibernation, into quarantine because of COVID. We were back out on the block in those classrooms every day. Mm -hmm. So um, in Memphis, we're doing the same thing. We're going to be building another one of those pop-up schools on the corner and make it accessible to the young people in the community. And it would be so wonderful because we have like, you know, we let the kids go outside and we do like little like um, physical projects with them so they can get some sort of, you know, playtime in. But you have a whole gymnasium. So it would be really beautiful if in Memphis, sure, you might come here and you might you might go to school with us, but if they could come to a program and use your gym or your facility for something else after school or something like that, that would be tremendous. And if they could see the community working together like that, because in Memphis, I don't see a lot of that kind of work being done. I don't see the bridge building and I don't see um, people crossing lines and working together too much. So I'm really excited about coming there to do this. And, and I would be, it would be really great if I could work with Memphis Rocks. We would be honored and we would love that. And it would enrich us infinitely. Um, uh, and, and, you know, maybe someday we can, we can help, you know, amplify your vision in, in Chicago somehow. Um, one of the reasons, um, I started teaching was because I felt the poison of the educational system. Education comes from the Latin word educato. It means to draw out, not to drill in. We drill into our kids and they get bored and numb. There's a reason we put up chain link fences around every school. They're like prisons. We hold them in. We try to teach them what we want them to know rather than ask them the essential question, which is, who are you? Yep. How can I bring out the light in you? And that's what you do. And, and Father Gregory Boyle's work also speaks to what you're talking about. I uh, love him. I, I love, love him. him. Homeboy industry. I homeboy. Love homeboy. Yeah. If, it wasn't, yeah. if it wasn't so cold, I'd be wearing my homeboy hat. Um, yeah. Father Greg came to our facility. I feel like a young iteration of what he's doing um, in Los Angeles. So he's a, uh, I, I consider myself his student. He's my mentor. Um, but nothing stops, uh, as you know, his motto, nothing stops a bullet like a job. Yeah. And, and so, does. and to train these kids, I don't know why we have this idea that you, oh, it's only college. There's so many people that are quote successful in life that have a skill. That's something that they love a trade. It could be making a cutting board. It could be yeah. learning a cooking skill, a, a plumbing skill, um, whatever skill, what draws your heart. Um, and then from there, it's the psychological, emotional trauma that must be met, whatever's happened in the family, um, because the job gets you there, but then that trauma comes up and then he's, uh -huh. he gets involved with getting the kids the resources they need to uh -huh. be counseled. Yeah. I'm going to um, go ahead. Go ahead, Tamar. No, no, no. It's okay. Because, yeah, it, it's fine. Go ahead. 
Uh, I was going to bring in a question from the chat and then I've got another question for Brad and then kind of a bigger issue question that I would like to touch on. Um, our question is from Sarah. It says, Rabbi Manasseh, how did your Jewish day school experience growing up inform the inspired work you're doing? And thank you. Your mother must be, <laughs> must be driving so much. Oh my goodness. That's so cute. Okay. So um, how did, how did your Jewish day school experience growing up inform the inspired work you're doing? Um, it helped me understand uh, the mainstream Ju Jewish community. It didn't. I mean, I went to a temple that was all black growing up. So it was. Ne it wasn't. I mean, the religious studies part was. I, I guess it was okay. I was. My mother might have sent me there for that, maybe. But I didn't. I didn't send my kids to that school for the same reason because I know that's not what I got out of it. I didn't go there to study Torah and learn who I should do this and that. I didn't go. To, I, I went to actually get comfortable with being a Jew in the world where there aren't many black Jews. So I'm going to go and I'm going to spend all of these years in elementary school full of Jews that don't look like me. So when I grow up, I can own my Judaism. I, I, can, I can be firm in it because it's mine. I fought for it my whole life. I can stand by it and stand on it. I can do that. And nobody can question me. And nobody can make me question myself because for so many years, I, I mean, I grew up in this. And so I think for me, it was more of the so socialization within the Jewish community that I got from this, how to do it, how to socialize, how to be your own kind of Jew in a place where, I mean, it was a microcosm of the Jewish world of America. For me. There were no other black kids there, but I was still Jewish, just like right now, not a whole lot of other black adults that are Jewish around. And people are constantly that question, the how are you black and Jewish? Or how did you get this way? Or hey, in the, in the movie, you're in, in North Carolina and your family were slaves. And so how are you Jewish? Yeah, I learned how to deal with that when I was in fifth grade. So that doesn't phase me now. I can fully work and embrace my Judaism and work in the spirit of it and work from a Jewish perspective and a Jewish understanding. I can do that without the rest of the politics that go on in the Jewish community, without the rest of the questioning that goes on. I can completely write that out, just completely block that out so I can do the real work. And that's what Jewish Day Schools taught me. And I mean, like right now, that's that's what informs my work. That ability to be able to be exactly who I am and do exactly what I want to do and not worry about what anybody else thinks about it. That's what it taught me. Wonderful. You have a great attitude. What was that? You have a great attitude. Oh, thank you. Martin Luther King. It's just like, I, it, I'm not gonna let your obstacle be my obstacle, right? That's that's exactly. like that's not my problem. Yeah. 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 You got work to do. Right. You, yeah. you got so much energy. As Martin Luther King said, it said uh, it's not your it's it, it it's uh, it's not your uh, what is it? Your attitude, not your aptitude will determine your altitude. So yeah. it's your attitude, not your aptitude, not the smart. I don't have to be the smartest person in the world. I got intelligence, but my attitude is going to determine my altitude. Exactly. You are flying high. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, you just really have to be able, people really need help right now. And you and people often ask, like, hey, are you going to go into politics? No, because I really have a lot of work to do. I have real work to do. And I can't do that if people are saying, well, you're blue or you're red, you're from a blue state or a red state or you're a Democrat or a Republican. Or, I don't want to argue about my politics because that keeps me from doing the real work that I do on the ground. The real work that people need in our communities. So I can't let that hold me back. I can't, I don't let anything hold me back because people need what I offer. People need what you offer. So people who don't understand that exactly just yet, I don't let it hold me back mm. at all. Mm. Such a great attitude. Um, Brad, I want to ask you about a specific um, incident in the film where a police officer walked up and um, you had this sort of what seemed like a really positive interaction uh, with the officer. And, and he said something like, um, and, and please correct me if I have it wrong, like, I'll see you tomorrow or I'll be back or something. Can you talk to us what happened and what happened after that? And what the, re and I'm going to go back to Tamar, what the relationship or lack of relationship, whatever it is with the police and mask is. And then to Tom with the same question about police Memphis rocks, um, because there is a police presence in these neighborhoods. And um, I'm curious about the interactions with the organizations and what happened behind the scenes in the film. So Brad, I'll start with you. Yeah, so that was actually the first, 
uh, shooting day. And it was the first day uh, that summer that Tamar and Mask were on the block. So you saw in the film, there's a big group of Masons who came out to, to help that day. And it was, it was really like almost a block party atmosphere. And that officer was standing on the corner there for a good part of the afternoon. Like he was there and he was having a ball. He was talking to people. He was laughing and joking around. I spoke with him a little bit off camera. He seemed like he was, you know, really well integrated into that uh, neighborhood. And after we finished filming that day, I went up to Tamar and I said, look, isn't that great? This cop was here and he was, you know, really getting along with people and interacting. And she looked at me and she said, we will never see him again. And she was absolutely right. That guy never came back. He wasn't part of the precinct that uh, is responsible for 75th and Stewart. He, I think, is one precinct over. And she said, he'll never, you'll never see that guy again. And unfortunately, she was right. I, I felt so naive for thinking, oh, look, you know, it's not, as, it's not the way that people describe it. It's totally different. But it's not totally different. Tamar, can you um, deepen this conversation a little bit for us and and what the relationship between, if any, there has been between um, the police officers in Chicago and Mask? Well, we don't really have a relationship. The, the, the police in Chicago, I, they really honestly need to work on their internal relationship first, how they get along with each other. Because some of them are black and some of them are white, but all of them are blue. But they're all blue when they get in those patrol cars they come in our neighborhood but behind closed doors they're not like that and they have their own issues that they need to take care of but i don't have a relationship with cpd and the thing is i mean i told cpd that there was going to be a shooting at a funeral that it could possibly get really violent and they needed to have squad cars there and they needed to have cars there and helicopters and everybody else every available man that they could get there they needed to have them to patrol this to go and actually secure this funeral and they blew it off and 15 people got shot at a funeral. Some of them were kids and most of them were women because you ignored what I said. So you tell the community, if you see something, say something. And then when the community says something, you go and say, hey, that wasn't a credible tip. So the thing about this for me is I'm kind of glad we've never really had a relationship with the police because I know for a fact, seen them with my own two eyes, what a community that comes together can do. So... When when we have discussions about defunding the police, I defunded the police on my block years ago. In six years, for this to be for that corner to be a hot spot, one of the most violent corners in the city of Chicago, for it to be as hot as it is, we've never called the police. We've called the police twice, and it wasn't for anything that happened on our block. It was something that happened down the street or a car accident that happened the other way. But it was never because it was something that happened on that block that we couldn't handle. And we've seen everything. We've seen guns, we've seen fights, we've seen all sorts of stuff. But never once was it anything that we couldn't exactly handle. And and the thing for that, the, for me with that, is I request when I'm here, I don't need you to come through here. You don't have to keep driving through here. Everything is under control over here. Go somewhere else and do that. Because when you come here, you change the atmosphere. And my thing is, I think communities are, if people are, are galvanized and people are motivated and people are encouraged and inspired and people can see, you know, what change can actually come about in their community when they're actually made a part of it, when regular, normal, everyday people, not the college educated, not the rich, not the any of that, just regular people, regular people who go to work and, and they shop for Instacart, they drive Uber Eats or whatever. Yeah, those people are people that can make differences in community. You have to make sure you contact, you bring everybody into it because we all live here. So it's not just a job of one kind of people, it's the job for all of us. But when you bring all of those people together and everybody has a vested interest in seeing their community improve and keeping their kids alive, you don't need the police. You just don't need them as much. So my thing is come when you're called, but otherwise, no thank you. We don't need that here because there are too many, there's too many police misconduct charges. There's too many um, 
police harassment charges. I've been harassed by the police. It is really no law that the police in Chicago really actually have to follow. You can't talk on your cell phone um, in Chicago on a phone. I mean, in the car while you're driving. I've seen police blow a red light, red a stop sign while on the phone and flipping us off all at the same time. So I don't have too much faith in the police. I don't put any in them. I put it in the community. So I think there are ways that, I mean, I honestly think that the community, there needs to be stronger community uh, policing initiatives out there than what there are. There needs to be more people who are the communities just being encouraged to actually get involved. And that's not necessarily what's encouraged in Chicago. Tom, do you have any anything to say about this um, in relationship to rocks? Nothing better than that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, it's a hard question. Yeah. Uh, well, we at Rocks we try as best we can for the police who are still in our neighborhood to meet the kids because just like the mask organization, when you meet somebody and love somebody, it's hard to be violent to that person. You can, you can find a humanity there. But it's challenging because I have been a personal witness to my friends, colleagues, younger brothers and sisters being arrested for a broken taillight when they would laugh it off if it was me in the car. I have been in a car, one experience that I have was very tangible because I don't look like them and our culture doesn't see me that way. I was in a car with my one of my uh, top leaders, Chris Dean. You know Chris Marcy. He's one of our great leaders, young, oh, yeah. black, brilliant young man. And he was in a borrowed truck from a friend of his because his car was in the shop. And we're driving in East Memphis, which is a white neighborhood, and the police are behind us. And Chris goes 10 and 2 on the steering wheel, and he gets nervous. And I've never seen Chris nervous. I said, Chris, what's wrong? He goes, police are behind me. I said, it's cool, man. You're not doing anything wrong. He goes, no, man, like, you don't understand the police are behind me. This is East Memphis. I'm in a truck that doesn't have my name on it. This could be serious. And I saw Chris fear for his life. And I felt that fear. And so that's why Tamar can speak about this at a much more intimate level than I can. I've experienced it in, in situations second, firsthand, but not in the right. primary fear. So I, I think the police represent the state. I don't think police are bad. I think they're in a system that has taught them that there's bad out there. The bad existed in the state that oppressed the people that has never been reconciled and dealt with. So they are instruments of a state that needs to do its own share of healing and, and accountability. And until that goes away, we're going to have these instruments that, that take the states, do the state's bidding and don't see the humanity and the responsibility that the state has for the situation. It all comes back to humanity. No, go ahead, Tamar. And, and you know, I live where I live. I don't live on 75th and Stork. I live a mile away from Barack Obama's Chicago home. And my neighbors, I live in a neighborhood called Bronzeville that is no longer Bronze. It was Bronze because it was the only place that black people could live when they came to Chicago during the Great Migration. And now there are hardly any black people there because they can't afford it. So, it's completely different the way that the police treat people where I live. Now, when I get to the block, it's a different story. And I learned something. I came to understand something. People that live where I live, my neighbors love the police because they feel protected. People from 75th fear the police because these are the people that we have to protect. That we, These are the people that the people on my block need to be protected from. There's a difference. When the police see you as that bad element, and this is the bad, these are the bad people that we have to protect all of the good people from. What do you think the quote unquote bad people feel like? And what makes them the bad people? Because they're poor, because they live in this neighborhood, and, you know, this is the criminal element. So if you go outside of that neighborhood, it, it looks like you're gonna get on a bus to go to downtown Chicago. Or if it looks like you're going to go somewhere, you're getting out of the car to go have lunch in a neighborhood that you shouldn't be in, you're probably going to get pulled up. You're going to get harassed and you're never going to go back because you don't want to deal with that. Because like it is, it is scary. Anytime the police get behind you, it is scary. It's always scary. And they know that they're scared. So people will stay around 75th and Stewart and not come to where I live because they don't want to get arrested. They don't want to get harassed. They don't want to have to show their license and keep their hands on the steering wheel. They don't want to be murdered at a stoplight. They don't want to do those things. 
But police look very different to those taxpayers who feel like they're being protected than it does to the people who are barely making it that the police feel like they have to protect the other people from. It's scary. It's 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 just it blows your mind when you think about it. And it keeps people separate, you know, it, it, it keeps the vision, uh, you know, the geographical segregation intact and it keeps yep. the, the wealthy and white neighbor, you know, white neighbors yep. feeling safe and it feels, you know, yep. I mean, it, it maintains the status quo. And I think what Tamar is doing and what Tom is, is doing, what, what they're both doing is contributing to the solution and um, building bridges and providing training and a place for people for kids to go and a place for adults to go and um and and truly making a difference by really doing the work and and not just talking about it right you got to walk the walk and not just talk the talk um brad can i ask you what it was like watching tamar from and mask uh from behind the lens uh you know she is as you can well see for yourself she is a force of nature um, and from the first day of filming I just knew like stay out of her way and let her do her thing and just try to capture as much of it as possible um, you know watching what she does and listening to Tom sounds like the work that he's doing is so similar to Tamar and he said it earlier and it's exactly this it's the everyday showing up, the showing up every day and proving your commitment. So people stop stealing from Tom when they realized he wasn't going anywhere. And Tamar does the God's work is in the daily interactions. It's the it's the sweeping up of the block. It's the shoveling the dirt. It's the arranging for the concrete to be poured. It's the cooking of the meals. It's the shopping for the food for the meals. That's really the work. Uh, you know, Tamar never feels like she deserves the many awards that she gets. And she's obviously completely wrong on that because she does deserve them and more. But it's, you know, the, 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 um, the recognition and the awards and maybe even the film, these are great. But it's really that, you know, the everyday showing up when you're not feeling like it or when you had a bad night the night before or when you're, you know, not in the mood to do it, but you're still there. And, you know, Tamar doesn't eat. She doesn't sleep. She just does. This isn't even a job. It's a calling. Uh, and Tom also said it earlier, like she's a rabbi, you know, and, and that's something that I wanted to the, the film to really hone in on that. It doesn't matter if she gets her ordination because the work that she's doing, she's a rabbi on that block and beyond. So so as a filmmaker, I mean, and, and also she just moves at like, you know, 150 miles an hour, you know, from from the minute that she starts until the minute that she stops. Um, you know, it's just like, just let her do her thing and just try not to get in her way. Tamar, where are you in your um, ordination at this point? Oh, I've actually been offered smicha, and I was supposed to actually be ordained December 12th, but COVID shut that down. So um, it's just delayed, no longer denied. So I'm, I'm being patient, I'm waiting, but even while I'm waiting, the work is still being done. And I see someone in the chat, because I have to jump off, but I see someone in the chat asked about um, why I was in Memphis. Why I was in Memphis, because Mass Memphis is, I mean, they're they're shaping up to be one of the biggest chapters. And they are fully committed. And I'm so excited about the work that they want to do there and all of the things that we're going to be doing there. So, yes, I was there for that. And, I mean, I think everybody should join up. I think that they would love to have your support. And, honestly, I think, that the Jewish community is that much better for having allies who are black, for having friends who would say, like um, on the day when the um, Pittsburgh shooting happened, when the when that horrible, horrible Shabbat shooting happened. Um, that day we had kids from the block, 19 years old, 22 years old, black kids calling me saying, you're a temple, are you okay? How did you even know I was a temple? Well, Saturday morning, of course you're a temple. But you're not a Jew, but you know when Jews go to temple? And not only were they concerned about me, well, what about our friends? What about our other Jewish friends? What about the other Jews that go to temple 
um, in, in, in the birds. You had black kids concerned about what was happening to white Jews in a place. The nearest synagogue to 75th and Stewart is probably about six miles. And it's in an all white neighborhood. And if they go there, there are cops standing outside. And if they try to go in, they're probably going to get arrested because what are you doing here? But yet they were still concerned about what was happening to their Jewish friends that day, that day. And they said, do they need anything from us? Do they need us to protect them? Memphis, Jews in Memphis can use allies like that. Just like black people in Memphis can use allies like the Jewish community. And it's my job to make sure I build those bridges wherever I go. And I think that everybody is just, it's everybody's the better for it. There's no downside to having a bigger community. There's no downside to knowing more people, to loving more people, to being loved and accepted by more people. There's no downside to that. So I'm really hoping that as many people as possible will think about joining up. Absolutely. And you talk about this alliance. Um, we've got another panel discussion coming up on March 3rd about the Shared Legacies documentary um, that, of course, talks about the shared legacies between the Black community and the Jewish community. So stay tuned for that, everybody. Tom, I think you were about to jump in. I was going to say, I told you she was a rabbi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Does it not mean, I, I don't want to speak out of turn. I'm not, you know. I, Go for you know, it. We have no turns. But I think it means much more to the Jewish and Judaic community than it would ever mean for this woman to be officially anointed a rabbi. She is a rabbi. You also, in that shawl or whatever, from my perspective, you are the Dalai Mama. I mean, <laughs> you, you have it all covered. You look That's like fantastic, monk, Tom. I love that. An ancestral I mean, monk from from ancient times. And I'm sure that's where your spirit is, is originating. So that's my new goal is for somebody to call me the Dolly mama. I've been called the Pope before, but I really do <laughs> like the Dolly. Actually, I'll be the Dolly mama. That's what I'm going to call. I love it. that. That's my new goal in I'm life. Somebody has yes. Can I tell you a little serendipity? I literally uh, just stopped to get on this zoom call. I'm writing a screenplay that breaks the stained glass ceiling for women in the Catholic and Christian faith. And it's an entry point to breaking the stained glass ceiling in the Judaic faith and other faith. The, the, the new iteration of faith is, is to un unleash the power of women, to get the divine feminine and that wisdom incorporated fully. Uh, it's not about having a male dominated faith or a female dominated faith. It is a God dominated faith. Exactly. And, and these are expressions of the divine in, 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 in a different way. And we need them desperately. So. Anyway, I'm, I feel no, such thank a you. to be a part thank of it. Thank you. I was watching the film go, when it took the turn and she was a rabbi, I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Knew you were going to love it. Uh, we do have a question from Rachel Shankman that I want to get in here uh, before our time is up tonight. And it's to Tamar. Uh, Rachel would like to know about your son and how he feels about your work. Um, I'm sorry, my son like walks on water and he can probably turn it into wine. And I mean, I don't know if Jews really had space lasers, it would be him. He would have built the space lasers. Like he is just so perfect. I mean, and I, I know nobody's perfect, but this kid is, he has this, this, he's just a giver. He cares. He is actually one of the best teachers, maybe the best teacher in our school. And he shows up every day and he is, in many cases, the most positive black male role model that any of these kids have. So he holds himself to a certain standard because he wants them to hold themselves to a certain standard. He wants to see them treating how he treats himself so they see how, to, how they should treat themselves, how they should behave. So I really love that being so young, he's embraced that role. And... Um, he's very supportive of everything. I mean, he basically, the school is his thing. And he said, this is his, this is his tikkun olam. This is him being a mensch. This is what he has to do. So he said, I don't ever have to go to temple. I get up and go to work every day. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that because that's what he does. So um, he really, really loves it. And I mean, for all of the Jewish moms and grandmoms on this call, he is single. And he's very <laughs> handsome, very <laughs> handsome, and he's eligible. So just don't. And tell for him the I'm crowd, how old is he? For the crowd, twenty-two years old. Hear that, everybody. He's twenty-two and he's Jewish and he's single. 
and he's yes. in Chicago. And he's a very good boy. Very We're, good boy. We work here. And yeah. he can, and cook. So yeah. Oh, and he cooks. You hear that everybody? All right. Yeah. Um, anything, anything anybody wants to add before we close out for the night? I want to thank everybody. Brad, Tom, Tamara, thank you all so much for being here. Brad, thank you so much for your incredible film, for all of your work. Tamar, for the work that you're doing in Chicago that you're bringing to Memphis. Tom, for the work you're doing in Memphis. This is just so serendipitous. I'm grateful to each of you. This has been a fantastic conversation, but anything else that y'all want to add before we close I out? Wanna, um, I want to plug an event. I'm yeah, super please. excited about it. Plug um, it. Mass will be hosting, well, Mass Memphis is hosting an all-city prom um, May 21st for all of the Memphis high school students who hadn't been to school during the pandemic. They're gonna can you email me this information too, tomorrow, and I'll get it out I'll to can. everybody? Uh, okay, I great. Definitely can. Awesome. So um, we are, and we're electing, we're giving out five $1,000 scholarships for all of the kids for kids who are going to college. So um, we would love your support because some of the kids can't afford to buy tickets. So we're sponsoring kids and we would love it. If you guys would sponsor some kids, I mean, they, they've earned this. A lot of them have worked very hard. And we really want to show them how much we support them and we appreciate their work and we want to continue to encourage. All right. Tamar's going to get me that information. I will get it out to everybody. How about you, Tom? Any final notes about your work, about Tamar's work, about Memphis Rocks? Um, well, we just want to be aligned with masks so you can hook us up and how we can support each other. I'm, I'm more than uh, feel more than blessed to do that. Tamar, you are aptly named. Uh, I think Tamar is short for tomorrow, and that's how we get there, this kind of attitude, um, which is going to determine our altitude. And Brad, um, I know how hard it is to make a film. Marcy, I don't know how hard it is to put on a festival like this, but I must tell you, while we shine the light at the work that, you know, Tamar is doing, and, you know, I, I, I walk in her footsteps, uh, what we're trying to do, don't forget the role of the witness. You, you, the role of the witness is so valuable and you both are witnesses to tell Tamar's story and to help us tell our story. And, and it's critical. Um, so please, we want to honor you as well. Thank you so much. And, and, and Brad, any final thoughts before we close out? Yeah. Stay tuned for a sequel. <laughs> oh, absolutely. We're ready for it. No pun intended. Really, that was that was good. That was you know what we're going to close with that because that was too perfect. We're ready for it. Um, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Brad, Tom, Tamar. This was fantastic. And Memphis Rocks. If you want a tour, let me know. I'm going to go down there with you. I'm going to show you what it's all about. It's incredible, Brad. If you're ever in Memphis, I'm going to take you down there, and um, we'll get all the information about out about Mask in Memphis as well and the prom. I think she said May 21st and this was great. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Peace, everybody. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.